Colonel Heathman in Illinois. Hey, you're up. Thank you, Jeremy. It is an absolute pleasure to meet you. I've had uh, uh, fellow pilots who have been through the D school, and and I'm just waiting for my chance to to come out there as well. So, um, cool. I, I've had the opportunity to to explore this this idea of not I won't call it idea this this element of innovation within the Air Force many, many times. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we've heard our senior leaders tell airmen, all of us, every airman's an innovator. And and while I understand the essence and the, the championing of that kind of language, it is very confusing as I have led uh, Air Force bases and had to try to explain, you know, what this is all about, what this means. And, and one of my tenets in my strategy was driving a culture of innovation um, because it wasn't just about establishing an innovation hub on the base, uh, you know, having a 500 square foot room, a 3D printer and a cool chair, and now we're innovators. Right. But that tends to be the idea. Um, yeah. And I'm seeing that now even in private industry that they kind of default to that. Uh, what? Why are we having such, why are some organizations having a tough time with the word innovation in general? And why, are there, why is there such confusion around that? Yeah, that's a really great question, Scott. And I've, I've really enjoyed the opportunities I've had to work with the Armed Forces. We did a program with uh, U.S. Space Command a few years ago, which was really in, uh, in um, you know, Colorado Springs, Peterson, which was an incredible experience. Um, <clears throat> I think, as we were discussing earlier, this the challenge of innovation as event rather than innovation as practice as cap as individual and organizational capability is part of the culprit here so if innovation if we got to go to the 3d printer room and sit in the cool chair to have really great ideas then you know then it's a matter of well when am i invited into the room and wh when do i have an idea worth 3d printing and all that stuff right um, but if you look at really innovative organizations, I would take two as an example. You look at Intuit, which is probably one of the best, other than Amazon, perhaps one of the best examples of customer obsession and innovation. That's not the way, you know, my, my good friend Diego Rodriguez was the chief product officer of Intuit for a number of years. I know Brad Smith, the former CEO, quite well. And they they don't approach innovation in that way. It's not an episodic activity. It's not an event. Um and so I think, you know, one of my, one of the things that I have been advocating with leaders, I've got a, a CEO of a NBA team uh, in the U.S. Are there, NBA, I guess the Raptors, I was going to say, are there NBA teams outside the U.S.? Uh, the Raptors. Um, but uh, one of the, one of the CEOs, of one of these organizations was asking me about how do I infuse innovation into our DNA? And he and I are, you know, having weekly calls talking about this challenge. And one of the things I think is important is instead of making it some outside thing, in which case you kind of risk organ rejection, so to speak, by trying to infuse something new, instead starting to name and attribute successes that you have experienced to different ways of working. Kind of gets a little bit to the, the question we were talking about earlier, I think, with Nancy. Um, <clears throat> and what I mean by that is, this this team experienced a you know a national celebrated success recently, and he was telling me I want to have a happy hour with the sales teams to celebrate what they've done. How do I use it as a moment to kind of reinforce? And we basically I I happened to be in Japan recently, and so the the kind of subway signs were on my mind. Unexpected uh, input, right? Inspiration. Um, but uh, I basically gave the illustration of, you know, this endpoint, which is a kind of a universally acknowledged innovation and, and success. I said, okay, if you picture a train line, so to speak, this is the endpoint. And everybody knows we did that great. And, and now if you think about the future of the train line, you want to take the next hill. The question is, what are the behaviors that you want to reinforce or see replicated? I would put on the train line as we're debriefing, so to speak, what are the key behaviors, right? One of them was cross-functional collaboration. That's a great example of departments that had never really worked together, working together, right? Uh, another example was there was an enormous volume of, he actually had a 2000 idea challenge that he had instituted a few months before. And this is one of the ideas that came out. Another thing was there were a bunch of failures. And what we talked about was, if you want the team the, or the organization to tech, take the next mountain in an innovative way, instead of bringing in some new methodology, codify what we already do. This is who we are. Of course, we cross-functionally collaborate. Did you see what we did at the blankety blank? 
Of course, we have tons of failures. Did you see the blank in the blank that led to that success, right? And actually codifying that and using moments of success to reinforce the key principles or the, the behaviors and the mindsets that you hope people leverage moving forward. A lot of times when we tell stories retrospectively, you know, if you hear a founder tell a story, it's, it's like, um, it can be like manifest destiny. It had to happen this way. You know, it's, it was just a straight line to success. And we all know that's not true in our lives, but painting the, a realistic picture uh, is really hard to do, to do honestly. And yet that's so important to reinforcing so many of the values of idea flow or, or an innovation organization in general. And so what I might suggest, I don't know much about your context in particular, but if there are wins, finding ways to attribute, and maybe it's it's a little bit of inception, maybe it's a little bit of projection, I'll grant you that. But if there are ways to attribute the outcome to the kinds of behaviors that you know you want to see moving forward. You can you can make innovation already a part of the DNA rather than it's like a blood transfusion. We need to we we need something from outside. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. And and I will validate something you said earlier that when I moved to this my last base, instead of stocking the innovation space or ecosystem with kind of more experienced talent. I stocked it with some of the youngest people on the base. Mm. And I tell you, it was remarkable the changes I saw mm. in, in idea generation and the volume. Um, yeah. You know, so I, I'm a believer in it. And so I appreciate the book. You, so. you know, one, one actually, actually, you're making me think of one other thing. I apologize to, to go. I know, I'm sure, Scott, you have other question askers. Just one simple thing that I think is a, a key cultural touchstone is um, since probably the 1960s, there's been an assignment at Stanford, which is very uh, central to innovation, which is keep a bug list. And <clears throat> that's long before computer programming entered common parlance. It's not referring to errors and lines of code. It's referring to the one of the fundamental behaviors of an innovator is attending to annoyances. What are the things that bug you? Write them down. And, you know, you, you hear this phrase sometimes, don't bring me problems, bring me solutions. You know, one, I mean, certainly that's better than bring me solution, as we talked about earlier. But an innovation leader says, bring me problems. Great. I love problems. That's awesome. You know why? Because problem identification is the first step to innovation, right? I want to be commissioning a bunch of airmen who are problem finders, not complainers, by the way. That's not what I mean, right? But people who are attuned, you know, even Jerry Seinfeld, if you hear, like, he's got a great interview where he talks about, I think Tim Ferriss asked him, where do you get all your jokes? He said, oh, my overly sensitive nature. I'm annoyed at everything, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which is great. But I mean, by the way, comedy and innovation have a lot in common. Arthur Kessler wrote a great book, which none of us have time to read called The Act of Creation. I only had the chance to read it because I got COVID before the vaccine. So I had like, you know, weeks on my back. Um, it's 800 page book, but he actually compares comedy and innovation, scientific discovery and aesthetic beauty, actually, they all really tie together. But anyway, Seinfeld attends, and he said, one of the challenges with wealth, you know, feel, feel bad from later, um, is that you can insulate yourself from the difficulties of life. And he said, so the only way a comedian can succeed is you got to have kids, right? Just to <laughs> make sure you get more difficulties in life. Um, but, uh, <clears throat> which is a good joke. But the point is attending to or, and cultivating an awareness of problems to be solved is actually a really, you know, <clears throat> I haven't thought about this until right now, um, but, you know, this is just like a, this is like a spontaneous improvisational innovation, perhaps. You see idea boxes or suggestion boxes, maybe a step upstream of the suggestion box is the problem box, right? I have no, I have no suggestions, but boy, is this annoying to me, right? Yeah. Why, why not? Right. Um, I think that's that starts to cultivate again, you may not ever do anything with those problems, but for people to become attuned to problems to be solved is the kind of necessary precondition to generating solutions to problems generally. And I don't think that we give problem awareness enough uh, valence in most organizations. Now, thank you. Yeah. I'm glad you added that because that whole clip was absolute gold.